My name is Dr. Hilsden. I'm a trauma and general surgeon. I focus mostly on trauma and emergency general surgery. And today we're going to talk about bowel obstruction and intestinal ischemia. And of course, we're doing the physical distancing thing. So I'm bringing you here into my home. We're going to share and uh, study this together. So let's get started. I think looking at the embryology is the first place to start when we're trying to understand any disease process. So recognize that the gastrointestinal tract starts off as a long tube. The abdominal cavity grows slower initially than the large and, and small intestines. And so they eviscerate around six weeks of gestational age. During that initial evisceration, there's a 90 degree counterclockwise turn. But by the 11th week of gestation, 10 to 11th week, the intestines return to the abdominal cavity and undergo a final 180 degree counterclockwise turn to give you that total 270 degree counterclockwise uh, rotation embryologically. This is important for fixation of the colon as well as to give the mesentery its length and its position, but also uh, to deal with the fact that there's disparate growth between the abdominal cavity and the gastrointestinal tract. As a fact, children are born with about 50% of their final intestinal length, and that uh, of an adult would be somewhere between six to eight meters, so children are about half that length. Other embryological features that are worth noting is the difference between the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut, and that's defined by the prominent three vessels of the gastrointestinal tract, the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. So the foregut, again, defined by the celiac axis, which its major branches are the splenic, the common hepatic, and the left gastric. That really gives you the distal esophagus, the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, bile ducts, pancreas, and the proximal part of the duodenum. The midgut really is more distal duodenum, jejunum, and the proximal one-third. Again, that's supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. And the distal one-third is supplies the, uh, by the inferior uh, mesenteric artery, the distal one-third of the large bowel and upper rectum. This slide helps us out a little bit. It gives us a bit more of a sense as to where these are located. So again, celiac artery, we have the common hepatic. We have the splenic. This branch here, this first branch, is the left gastric. And then this here is the gastroduodenal, not a, it's actually a branch of the common hepatic, but it's good to know it's an important uh, branch when it comes to gastrointestinal surgery. Here we have the superior mesenteric artery and then the inferior mesenteric artery. And again, small bowel largely for the superior mesenteric artery, that proximal one third of the colon, and then the uh, distal uh, two thirds of the colon being supplied by that inferior mesenteric artery. Another little point to note is that the superior mesenteric artery and the celiac artery are very close in relation to one another, but there's actually a fairly big gap between the SMA and the IMA. And this will appear when you're looking at CT scans or, or in the operating room, that's a relevant uh, anatomy. It should be also known that there are collaterals between the uh, IMA and the SMA, and that's important for areas of intestinal ischemia when we get to that point in the uh, lecture. An interesting consequence to that 270 degree turn, and I just actually want to go back here for one second. One interesting little fact here is you'll notice that the duodenum C loop, if you really pay attention, is actually about 270 degrees as well. You see, uh, you get that classic C loop picture, and it's stretched out here for the purposes of showing that IMA anatomy. Typically, it'll come up here a bit, but it's not quite 360, it's, it's 207 degrees, and that's reflected in the C loop of the. Um, duodenum. But again, also the same rotation gives us our position of that large bowel. Now, one thing that I want to point out here is the issue of partially retroperitoneal and completely intraperitoneal colon. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the purpose of the peritoneum? Well, the peritoneum and these two layers of cellular layers that uh, have a kind of fluid membrane between the two of them allow movement of the small bowel 
and the large bowel against the abdominal wall. So they, it allows it to move independently of one another. And that's really important because when we're dealing with the peristaltic action of the small bowel, we want there to be freedom of movement. Now, and again, the colon also has peristalsis, so a lot of it is truly fully intraperitoneal. But there is fixation of the ascending colon and the descending colon, and that makes it partially retroperitoneal. The distal rectum is fully in, uh, retroperitoneal, and again, the upper rectum, again, is a partially retroperitoneal structure. What's also important is that you get these areas where there could be extra mobility. So you have a fixed point here, which you can cause rotations of the colon against a fixed point. That creates an opportunity for volvulus or twisting. Again, the cecum is, a, is one of those places. That sigmoid colon is one of the places where the twisting can happen as is the transverse colon. So keep those structures in mind when you're thinking about twisting of the large bowel. So let's get on to the meat of our presentation here, bowel obstruction. And I'm hoping that you'll, in your mind, as you're thinking about all of these disease processes, think about categories, think about how they're broken down. So the first thing, what we're talking about today is mechanical obstruction. That's different than a functional obstruction. There are certainly bowel obstructions that, or situations where this fail to failure to pass gas and stool that are essentially functional obstructions. That would be something like a paralytic ileus post-surgery. Something like an acute colonic pseudo-obstruction or Ogilvy syndrome, which is something we deal with frequently. Those are, there's no anatomic abnormality there, but there's failure to pass stool and gas. They act as an obstruction. What we're talking about today is mechanical obstructions. And what that is, that's an anatomical disturbance of the intestinal tract that prevents passage of its intestinal contents. And we'll get to the cause of those in a minute. They can be either complete or incomplete, or complete and partial. And really what's key is that when you're talking about a complete bowel obstruction, you're talking about the failure to pass both stool and gas. In the case of um, a uh, partial obstruction, there may be some liquid or some uh, gas that gets by. It's not necessarily one or the other, but the key is something gets past that partial obstruction. They're still highly symptomatic, granted they're presenting to you with, uh, with these complaints, but there's something getting through, and that's the key with those partial obstructions. Now, we've talked about complete and partial. We've talked about um, mechanical and functional. Really, the core of what I want to talk about today is this, is, are these categories the large versus the small, and the adhesive versus non-adhesive, okay? Now, typically all large bowel obstructions are non-adhesive, but small bowel obstructions may be adhesive or non-adhesive and the approach is different. So let's start with some uh, causes. We're breaking them down between large and small here. So small bowel obstruction, the prominent causes are adhesions, hernias, neoplasm, and the other ones are smaller. Now, it's worth while noting that in Western civilizations, modern healthcare systems, adhesions are the number one cause of small bowel obstructions. And yet in the developing world, hernias are the number one cause. Now, if you think about what's going on here, it sort of makes sense. In Western uh, societies, the availability and access to surgery is so much better than in developing worlds. And if there's less access to surgery, then you're gonna have a less opportunity to have your hernia repaired. So for uh, so as a result, in the developing world, there's a lot more hernias, a, a lot more large unrepaired hernias that are causing uh, uh, trouble and relatively less surgery, so relatively fewer adhesions. Let's compare that to a large bowel obstruction. Large bowel obstruction is typically caused by neoplasm. That's the number one cause. If somebody comes in with a large bowel obstruction, I'm thinking cancer, diverticular disease, and volvulus. Now, diverticular disease is usually manifest as a stricture. Sometimes you can have acute uh, diverticulitis and perforation that might present as a large bowel obstruction, but typically we're talking about the stricturing disease. And it's good to note that diverticular disease is the most common form of inflammatory bowel disease. The most common cause of inflamed colon is diverticular disease. Now it's worth noting that stricture is an important cause of small bowel obstruction. And indeed, there are conditions that cause stricturing of both the large bowel and of the small bowel. And I'm not gonna tell you them right now, I want you to think about it. What could those 
causes B? What would be something, a, a disease that can cause stricturing of the large colon, but it can also functionally cause stricturing of the small bowel? All right. Sometimes I like to put up these little surgical recall points. And these are just little things that are worthwhile remembering, and they may not be familiar to you at this stage. So the key clinical feature of a bowel obstruction is this concept of obstipation. So what is obstipation? Well, it's failure to pass stool or gas. There isn't necessarily a time course here. Typically when we're thinking about obstipation, we think about it after about 24 hours, but it could be earlier. But constipation is interesting. Constipation time is the key. Lots of patients will come and they'll say, well, I have hard stools or hard time passing stools. They're having this functional complaint of stool passage. That's not really what we mean by constipation. What we mean by constipation is this time course, fewer than three bowel movements per week or greater than three bowel, days between bowel movements. And you can see that they're related, they go together. Not to say that the change of bowel habit is not a useful clinical concern. It's not what we mean by constipation. And a patient might describe constipation and you, it's up to you to really ask, well, what do you mean by constipation? When was the last time you had a bowel movement? What's your, what is your, your concern here? Those are the questions you want to have uh, ask your patient when uh, they present and say, I have constipation. Try to define it. All right. So the next slide here, we have small bowel obstruction. And what's the clinical uh, presentation? So typically, it's a colicky abdominal pain. Now, I just want to give you a sense of what colic is. I'll sit back and just give you a description here. So colic is this intermittent abdominal discomfort. What's happening in the bowel obstruction, you have this fixed obstruction, and you have this the gastrointestinal tract proximal to it, and it's trying to overcome that obstruction, trying to push against that obstruction to, re to relieve it. That's, uh, that pressure, that pushing, is causing that abdominal cramping. It's, like it's squeezing hard against it, and then it stops. So the clinical presentation of colic is this intense, squeezing abdominal pain. Then it gets better momentarily, and it's a matter of minutes. Sometimes you'll recognize the use of the term colic in the medical world to describe something different. But really, when we're using colic, this is the key feature. It's that intermittent, intense, short abdominal pain that uh, re gets relieved in time. So they'll start off with this colic abdominal pain. Then they'll move on to this progressive nausea and vomiting. Finally, they end up with obstipation. Patients might complain of bloating. So this, this abdominal distension complaint, when patients complain about it, it's, it's bloating. And interestingly, they may actually have initial episode of diarrhea. In fact, they could even be presenting with you with abdominal pain, nausea, and uh, diarrhea. And what's happening there? Again, fixed obstruction. You have that intense activity of the gastrointestinal tract trying to overcome that obstruction. It's blocked. It's pushing, pushing, pushing. But recognize that those, those action potentials that are causing the squeezing of the intestines to overcome that obstruction are happening both proximal to the obstruction and distal to the obstruction. And so those action potentials happening distal to the obstruction are actually going to decompress the small bowel distally. And so that'll get increased activity, and then you're going to get that diarrhea complaint at first. And then they're going to go on to be completely obstipated. And that gives you that other key feature of physical exam. When you're listening, you might hear the initial increase in bowel sounds during these colicky episodes, but then it progresses to this quiet bowel sounds where you're not hearing much or tinkling bowel sounds. Those are the key features that you'll uh, encounter when you're listening uh, and auscultating in the setting of a bowel obstruction. Now, there are some things that are specifically worth noting on physical examination. They'll typically be uncomfortable during the colicky episodes. Oftentimes, they'll have some tachycardia. That's because of a decrease in their volume status. So they've been vomiting, they're not eating, they're dehydrated. They'll have abdominal distension. Again, they're complaining about bloating, but we'll notice the abdominal distension. And they might be diffusely uncomfortable when you palpate the abdomen. When you percuss, there'll be some uh, tympanic uh, sounds when you're percussing. Important to note some red flags here. So if they have hypotension or fever, that suggests that there could be a perforation or an area of ischemic small bowel related to the bowel obstruction. And that's a bad sign. That's indicator that you should probably go to the operating room. If they have peritonitis, 
that physical exam of a rigid abdomen or, or rebound tenderness or percussion tenderness, that's a bad sign. And if they haven't had surgery, that puts them in that non-adhesive category. To be an adhesive bowel obstruction, we, you need to have surgery. Although there are congenital adhesions, this is always the, the, the exception that proves the rule, the, the adhesions, those congenital adhesions are not what we're talking about with adhesive bowel obstruction. They would still be a non-adhesive category because we're talking about non-previous surgery cases, the virgin abdomen, as we would say. So what do you need to evaluate if you don't uh, remember anything on the physical exam element here? Remember to look for surgical scars. You're trying to prove that they are an adhesive bowel obstruction versus a non-adhesive. And the presence of surgical scars helps you with that evaluate for hernias because again in the developing world they may be the most common cause it's not to say that they're not an important cause in the western world as well masses again neoplasm was one of our differentials one of our causes and you want to look for those and really a large bowel obstruction uh, dre is uh, very useful because it's not uncommon for rectal cancer you can actually reach with your finger to be palpated and um, you don't want to miss that it's a very simple thing to do and it will have a massive impact on the management of the patient. Certainly rectal cancer is going to have a very unique approach to uh, managing that large bowel obstruction. You're certainly not going to be putting that patient back together. You'll probably just be giving him a, a stoma. So large bowel versus small bowel obstructions, they do present differently. So the small bowel, as I described, is this colic pain. This, this, you have this intense squeezing of the uh, peristalsis against that fiscal obstruction, which causes discomfort. They get early nausea and vomiting because they're obstructed and the stomach is an important sink for fluids in the small intestine. So the small intestine will preferentially dump into the stomach and that'll cause nausea and vomiting due to the gastric distension. Again, there's a history of prior surgery, that's key, and they have this central abdominal distension. And large bowel obstructions, again, progressive constipation is the cause. Remember, our number one cause here is malignancy, neoplasia. And so typically what will happen is that cancer in the lumen of the colon will grow and grow and grow, gradually causing more constipation till it ultimately causes an actual obstruction. After the obstruction happens and they're obstipated completely, then the colon will slowly dilate and then they develop pain later. And that's one of the reasons why there's later onset of nausea and there's rarely vomiting. And the reason why there's rarely vomiting is because the stomach doesn't operate as a sink for the large intestine. In fact, the large intestine, because of its diameter, will continue to accept uh, contents from the small bowel, despite there being a distal obstruction. Think about a, you have two balloons. You have a balloon that's been partially inflated and a balloon that hasn't been inflated yet. And when that balloon hasn't been completely inflated, it has more resistance when you're blowing in air because there's a greater change in the diameter for every liter of uh, air that you put into that balloon. But once it gets bigger, there's a smaller change to every time you put air uh, into the uh, balloon. Well, same idea with a large bowel. It's already large. The cecum has a larger diameter than any other uh, point along the gastrointestinal tract except the stomach. And so essentially, it'll always have a smaller change of diameter with a change in, in uh, fluid or volume uh, than the large bowel distal to that or the small bowel. So the smaller change in diameter, the smaller stretch will result in the cecum being the primary area where the uh, stretching occurs. And again, the cecum then therefore is the most common site of perforation of large bowel obstruction. Again, that progression, progressive constipation, progressive change of bowel habits go hand in hand because we're talking about that slowly development of a stricture, slow development of a cancer. Some more surgical recall for you. Just what are the three views of the admin? I want to put these facts in for you. So when you're ordering a test, well, I'm going to order three views of the admin in the emergency department. You know what you're ordering. So there's the upright abdomen. This one allows us to look at air fluid levels. We typically say more than three is abnormal, um, but exactly counting them is not, is not that useful. But recognize this is the view for the air fluid levels. The supine view gives us a sense of the size of the small bowel, the diameter. Okay, and it helps us differentiate a little bit between large and small. And the upright view allows us to look for free air. So see free air under the diaphragm is the key thing on the upright view. When you're looking at x-ray, you need to have some sense of what's normal, what's abnormal. Well, let's think about the three, six to nine rule. 
So typically the average diameter of a, of small bowel is about two centimeters. And we say, well, the upper limit of normal is two. Um, it's, we won't call it dilated until it's 50% more than the upper limit of normal. So that's three centimeters. Same thing with the large intestine. It's roughly about four centimeters typically. But again, um, it'll be dilated if it's above six. And then cecum, um, it's about six centimeters is the upper limit of normal and it's dilated uh, at nine. And you're, when you see a nine or greater centimeter cecum, like a, a 10 centimeter cecum situation, that's certainly uh, at a risk of perforation. You're getting concerned about that. So what are some indicators of a pending ischemia or perforation with a small bowel? So here's a little acronym for you, FATAL, remember this. If they have fever, if they have lactic acidosis, if they have tachycardia, if they have severe abdominal pain, really what we're talking about is peritonitis here, and or they have elevated white count, leukocytosis, those are red flag signs you're dealing with impending perforation in a small bowel obstruction. So you see a patient with small bowel obstruction, they have those features, that's a clinical sign for you to be concerned. This patient might have an area of ischemic small bowel, or we're dealing with an impending perforation. There are some differences on the x-ray. So small bowel obstructions tend to have centrally located dilated loops with multiple air flu levels, and there's a paucity of colonic gas. So the, bowel, the small bowel is obstructed, and distal, you have distal, distal decompression. That's consistent with, with a small bowel obstruction. With a large bowel obstruction, we have these more peripherally located uh, descended large bowel. You see far fewer air flu levels, because remember, the small bowel is gonna continue to dump into the large bowel because of that smaller diameter change we talked about. And typically, again, a paucity of small bowel gas as opposed to a paucity of large bowel gas in the opposite situation. We, again, we say this in the setting of a so-called competent ileocecal valve. And as I explained more, it's really not the, the fact that the ileocecal valve is competent, it's the fact that the, the large cecum represents a sink for the small bowel to dump in, okay? And that's how, how it's meant It's meant to play that role. If you think about the, the ultimate purpose of the large intestine, it's to absorb fluid, to, to solidify the stool, to get your water out of the stool. So you're gonna, it's gonna have a much slower transit time in the uh, large bowel and you don't want things backing up. So if you have this large sink uh, at the cecum, then even uh, in a relatively full cecum, the small bowel will continue to, to dump into that. And that has an advantage under healthy circumstances. So here's our x-ray, a couple little features worth noting. So again, large bowel, more peripheral uh, gas here, they're larger as well. A um, couple other things, you don't really see much in the way of small bowel gas. Opposite cases here. You see very, very little large bowel gas, there's some here, but you're seeing basically just small bowel gas. Other features that help you here, you have hostra for the large bowel, where you have in the small bowel, you have plique circ circularis or valvule conevente, saying essentially that these go all the way across. That's are the features that you see on uh, x ray. Just an example there. So what's our management? Well, the management does depend on what kind of bowel obstruction we're talking about. Specifically, if it's a small bowel adhesive obstruction, we're gonna use a CT scan to help us determine the grade and, uh, or severity of the small bowel obstruction. Certainly, it'll help us with a closed loop situation, which we'll discuss in a second. Um, and it helps us identify if the bowel at all is at risk of ischemia or perforation. We tend to put an NG tube down to help relieve the nausea and vomiting, decompress the stomach, give the patient some comfort. Because they've been vomiting and we're uh, removing fluids through the NG tube, they'll often have the electrolyte abnormalities and we wanna correct those. We wanna monitor them to ensure that the symptoms have improved, so we wanna do serial abdominal exams and x-rays to uh, rule out peritonitis or free air as uh, their management progresses. So the operation for a small bowel obstruction is a lysis adhesion, possible resection. And how do we decide? Well, there's sort of two approaches uh, that you'll see here in London. First is the gastrographin protocol. So without going into details, we essentially give them a, a, a bolus of gastrographin, which is used to uh, opacify the small bowel on x-rays. And that has an osmotic effect, but we can actually watch it go through the small bowel with serial x-rays and within 24 hours if it's in the colon then we are confident that the small bowel obstruction will resolve. If 
we decided to use a clinical approach, what we'll do is we'll just do serial abdominal exams, pay close attention to them, and decide whether uh, they're going to resolve within 24 to 40 hours of presentation to hospital. Typically, if you're leaving a patient with small bowel greater than um, 48 hours, that type of obstruction, obstruction greater than 40 hours, um, you're you're putting the patient at significant risk. Um, if we have a gastrograph and protocol or a tool or CT scans to kind of help us gauge the severity and likelihood that they'll it'll resolve, that can help you push the limits a little bit. But you really shouldn't be waiting too long on a bowel obstruction at that point. If there's concern for a closed loop, we need to operate right away. And again, that's usually raised on a CT uh, scan. And really, truly, uh, roughly about 85% of adhesive small bowel obstructions will, will resolve uh, without uh, operative management. Again, we're talking about adhesive cases here specifically, and um, still, uh, they're a very common presentation in hospitals, so it's not uncommon we do need to operate uh, because even though 85% will resolve spontaneously, 15% is not an insignificant number by any, by any means. I alluded to the concept of a closed loop obstruction a couple times. And essentially what this is, this is a situation where you have two sites that are obstructed, that are completely obstruction. And that can be an adhesive band that comes across the bowel at two sites. That can be a volvulus or an internal hernia that'll cause that to happen. Truly an incarcerated hernia as well would be a closed loop obstruction. In these cases, there's significant risk of vascular compromise, significant risk of perforation, um, and when you put the NG tube down, they might get some relief, but they're not going to get decompression of that loop. That loop is still obstructed and still causing them trouble. And also keep in mind that although uh, you might be dealing with uh, an obstruction really at one end of the large bowel, you need to think about it as a closed loop. You have to manage them that way. And we you oftentimes say that you can't go to sleep on a large bowel obstruction because essentially a closed loop. Even if the there's thought that there might be some decompression into the um, small bowel, recognize that again, because of that larger diameter, the large bowel is going to continue to expand and risk perforation because it'll always be a sink for that small bowel. Again, smaller changes of caliber will occur in the uh, large bowel per volume of fluid added as opposed to the small bowel. Just an important mathematical concept. If you have a uh, closed loop obstruction, there's some differences in presentation. They have colicky pain that progresses to continuous terrible pain quickly. They'll have tenderness over one spot that might be over the affected loop because there could be some localized uh, peritonitis over that loop. Uh, they'll typically be more unwell because um, we're dealing with an ischemic segment and it really is an indication for urgent surgery. They're high risk for uh, necrosis and perforation. And if they have a perforation, there's a mortality risk. One category that's worth mentioning is the non-adhesive small bowel obstruction. These are caused by things like a cancer or another anatomical abnormality that won't resolve with time. And that's the key thing here. The, the key thing about a non-adhesive small bowel obstruction is that there's a high rate of serious pathology, which will manifest as a small bowel obstruction at its, at its first presentation. Volvulus is one of our differentials for large bowel obstruction. I'm giving you an example of a sigmoid volvulus. And I explained this a little bit earlier, just touching back to what we talked about in the anatomical part of the talk, was that the cecum and the sigmoid colon and the transverse colon are fully interperitoneal. And if you take a look here, we have the upper rectum and we have the descending colon. These are fixed uh, partially retroperitoneal structures, but you have this redundant sigmoid volvulus or colon that can twist around these two fixed points, causing a obviously closed loop. This would be a closed loop bowel obstruction, if you can imagine. There's no way to decompress that, right? The, this is this is both ends are obstructed because it's been twisted around its axis. A little bit of a clue here on an x-ray. You can see this like a coffee bean sign. I really like this. And I like to think about the, the it, it points towards the um, area. The, the, the open end of the coffee bean points towards where it comes from. So it's pointing towards the left lower quadrant here. And that would be consistent with the sigmoid volvulus. If it was a cecal volvulus, it might point the other direction, for example. Again, large valve obstructions are not going to resolve with time in an NG tube because they're not adhesive. The top three causes of large bowel obstruction are malignancy, diverticular strictures, and volvulus. 
none of those things are going to get better without surgery. So you need to you need to operate on them. So surgery is indicated. And NG tube is not going to decompress them because, again, you need to think of large bowel obstruction as essentially closed loop. Even when we don't call them that, that's the concept you need to have in your head. If we operate, we have to resect typically. And we're dealing with compromised bowel, so we have a high rate of making colostomies when we do a large bowel obstruction. Now, in the case of a distal obstruction, like a rectal cancer that you might be able to feel, uh, there is a role for stenting, but usually they're a bridge to more definitive surgery. They're definitely an option for palliative care if the patient's too highly comorbid to tolerate surgery. So now we're going to move on to the ischemic uh, bowel segment. So we have really two sections here. The, the link between the um, large bowel and, let me correct myself, the, between the issue of bowel obstruction and ischemic bowel is the issue of ischemia. So we talked about a closed loop can cause a vascular compromise to the small bowel. So that's going to give you an ischemic small bowel or, or vascular compromise to the colon. Uh, it's ultimately a vascular issue that leads to perforation necrosis and is a concern. So it would be, it, they're related in that way. But we're going to focus on ischemic bowel in a little different way as its own entity, not necessarily related to bowel obstruction here next. So let's dive into it. Like bowel obstructions, and really anything I can do in surgery, I try to give you a categorization. So first of all, I'm going to tell you that when you're studying this, you might find that splanchnic vascular disease is where you'll find the literature. So just another term for you. But let's talk about the categories. We have small bowel versus large bowel. We have arterial occlusive versus venous occlusive versus low flow. So those are like causes. We have a management category, which we have medical versus surgical. And we have acute versus chronic, so a timing category. So anatomy, cause, management, and timing are different categories, different ways we can break down ischemic bowel, and they're all relevant and help us uh, understand the disease. So let's start off with the cause. So we're going to talk about arterial acute occlusive disease. There are two major causes of this. That's going to be the embolic cause or the thrombotic cause. And embolic is significantly more likely than thrombotic. Now, embolic is going to be the same kind of risk factors that are associated with stroke. The source of the embolus is the heart, typically, and those causes are going to be there for AFib. They're going to be the mural thrombus post-MI, valvular disease, those things that you're familiar with in your cardiac and, and uh, vascular stroke uh, lectures are going to apply to this as well. But thrombotic disease happens, just how there's embolic strokes and thrombotic strokes, there's embolic uh, ischemic colitis or ischemic small bowel, I should say, and thrombotic um, uh, vascular uh, disease of the, of the bowel. So the thrombotic causes, again, are those atherosclerotic risks, smoking, diabetes, certain genetic factors. Now, when we're dealing with acute arterial occlusive disease, the superior mesenteric artery is by far the most common. It's really not a disease of the IMA, certainly not the acute thrombotic or embolic events. Chronic maybe, but not so much acute. Thrombotic events usually occur at the SMA origin. We'll talk about that more in a second, but the distal ones are typically pushed, uh, embolics are typically pushed distally. Embolic causes more dense ischemia than thrombotic. And I'm just gonna sit on that for one second here. And the reason why that is, is because when someone has atherosclerosis disease of the SMA, you're gonna set up a situation where you're gonna develop more collaterals. So that when a thrombotic event happens, those collaterals are able to take over and support the small bowel, you have less dense ischemia. Whereas embolic event, you have relatively healthy vessels, you have less well-developed collaterals, and you throw a dense uh, clot down, you're gonna get a dense infarct. So again, arterial occlusive disease, more predominantly a small bowel issue. Surgery is frequently required, and when it happens, it's a high mortality rate, 55 to 85%. It is a serious disease, and, and we don't like to see this. I just want to give you this anatomy a little bit more, and this is kind of interesting. So here we have the atheroma that's clotted off, proximal, okay? This is a thrombotic event, proximal. So what's happening here is that you'll, you'll learn that the, at the ostea of blood vessels or where bifurcations occur or where there's a takeoff of a blood vessel, there's more turbulent blood flow. And this sets up an opportunity for 
atherosclerotic disease to develop. And so the SMA is no different than the iliacs, not different than uh, branchings of the carotid artery. Those are where uh, we get atheromas developing. And that atheroma is where the thrombotic event, that acute thrombotic event will, will oftentimes occur. Let's compare that to the embolic event. You have a healthy vessel, you throw off a clot, it, it migrates into the SMA and then it gets pushed by the blood pressure, distal, 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 until it causes that dense ischemia. So you're seeing a difference here between the thrombotic location proximally and the embolic location distally. And that's uh, useful for us to know and understand. It'll help us make a diagnosis. So here's a CT scan. This is a coronal cut. You can see at a pacified blood vessel here with this clot. Now this is gonna be the SMA, and you can see that the origin here is proximal, and this is a distal clot. So we're dealing with an embolic stroke here. And this would be certainly an indication that there's a risk of, of dense ischemia distal to that clot. And this might be that patient's laparotomy. So we go in and we see dead, dead, dead small bowel. So the little factor that's useful to know, if I were to ask you how much small bowel is required for someone to survive, there's definitely a limit. One thing you might want to know is whether the patient has an intact ileocecal valve or not. If the ileocecal valve is intact, the patient can survive longer with a shorter small bowel. The reason why that is, that causes some resistance and, and support of the um, uh, small bowel and will slow absorption down, for example, and will improve the patient's outcome. If they lose the ileocecal valve, they need a longer segment of small bowel to survive. Typically, though, what we say is 100 centimeters is the limit of survivability. Other than that, there's really no way they're going to support life with uh, enteric feeding only. And so that's an important concept. So if I look at this x-ray or this uh, operating room picture here, if this is a case of mine, I see no viable small bowel. This would be an open and closed case. I would say there's really no chance of survivability here. For orientation, this is a small bowel. Right up here at the very top of the picture, we see some transverse colon. And we see some momentum here, this fat, fatty structure there. And that'll help you out. But I don't see, I see no viable small bowel here. This would be a, uh, a terminal case when we uh, uh, take them to the operating room. So how do they present? Well, the severe sudden abdominal pain is the classic presentation, usually mid-abdominal pain. And then it might progress to nausea, vomiting, and or explosive uh, diarrhea is a, is a common part of that episode. Again, the intestine is going crazy. They have this uh, ischemic event and it's going to react to that and you're going to get some uh, contractions and, and decompression and that's going to give you the diarrhea. But the most common feature is this pain at a proportion where we have discomfort that's more prominent than what we find on physical examination. It's also a fever, tachycardia, and we'll appear unwell. Typically, the lactate is also elevated, which is a useful tool. So we'll, we'll see uh, metabolic acidosis, we'll see an elevated lactate and acute renal failure. Those are the kind of things you'll find on a patient with a severe acute arterial occlusion. All right. Now, we'll shift gears slightly to another category, venous occlusive disease. So it's a little bit different. These are patients who typically have either a hypercoagulable state, think about the same things that might be associated with DVTs, or they have a severe intercurrent illness. They're dehydrated. They're sick in hospital for some other reason that causes that low flow state and they get, um, a, they get some thrombus forming in the venous system. They're rarely surgical, okay? And if we're gonna operate on a venous occlusive disease, although they're very uncommon in large bowel anyway, it's gonna happen for small bowel disease, typically to resect. The presentation is gradual onset, distended abdomen, and they're just they're generally sick for some other reason. And we uh, they develop an alias, and you're investigating them for that reason. You find oh they've got a small bowel um, thrombus uh, in their venous uh, in the venous side, and so as a result, because it's not a dense ischemia, it's not the primary cause of their reason for being in hospital. Typically, we support them with fluids, keep them well hydrated, and anticoagulate them. The other cause category that we talked about is this chronic cause. And um, essentially, this is a condition of the elderly. They're patients with high atherosclerotic burden and they have a fixed stenosis. 
the typical presentation is someone who's got pain associated with meals. They develop a food fear and is associated with small meals and uh, progressive weight loss. They just, every time they eat, they just feel terrible. They got pain and they just, they, and over time, essentially there's their, they learn to not want to eat. Typically we make the diagnosis with the CT angiogram or CT uh, arteriogram. And uh, when you do decide to operate on chronic intestinal ischemia, you don't do it acutely. They're booked as an elective case because it's chronic. It's a revascularization procedure, like a bypass. We're going to bypass that that the proximal stenosis that I demonstrated on that slide uh, earlier. So, if we're looking at small bowel ischemia as a category, again, we we have our anatomical categories, we have the causes, we have the time courses, and we have the management. Let's look at small bowel ischemia as a whole, just kind of a summary category here. The arterial is more common than venous. The embolic causes are more likely to be surgical. They have more dense ischemia. The thrombotic causes, because of those collaterals, tend to be more medical. And again, venous causes tend to be medical. The classic presentation of small bowel arterial ischemia is pain out of proportion. And I want to reiterate, what does that mean? They have terrible, horrible, awful abdominal pain, and yet when you examine them, they have no peritonitis. Their exam, their belly can be soft, minimally tender. Let's talk about some clinical things. So again, pain out of proportion is a classic presentation for small bowel ischemia, but that's different from large. So that'll clue you in here. We're going to talk about large bowel ischemia a bit more. Their key feature is bloody bowel movements. They might have pain, but the key thing is frequently they're associated with bloody bowel movements. And what's happening, that ischemic bowel is causing sloughing of the mucosa and some bleeding, and that presents as, as bloody bowel movements. In addition, when we're trying to sort this out, the colonoscopy is a, is a good tool to help us decide if there's ischemic colitis, ischemia of the colon. All right, so as we're shifting into this new category of anatomical location, let's talk about large bowel ischemia. So I talked about splanchnic vascular occlusive disease as the buzzword name or something you might find in the literature for small bowel ischemia. Large bowel ischemia, we like the term ischemic colitis, and that's actually more commonly used than the splanchnic term, but just to help you. The cause is almost always low flow. There are tear occlusive causes, but low flow is by far the most common cause. They're much more common than small bowel ischemia. Because of the low flow state, because they occur in unwell patients, they tend to occur more frequently. And because it's not as dense a problem, it'll, it'll show up as, as something we find. Typically occurs in the watershed areas, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is in a second. Again, it's a disease of the elderly predominantly, and they're usually patients who are hospitalized for another reason. Maybe they had surgery or something, vascular surgery, aortic repair surgery, something that, that caused them to be unwell and the, those will see some ischemic colitis. And again, the surgical recall point here that I mentioned uh, before is that bloody bowel movements and, the, and using colonoscopy to help diagnose uh, uh, large bowel ischemia are some tools. So what are those watershed areas? Well, I talked earlier about the relationship between the IMA and the SMA, and that the SMA supplies that proximal one-third of the colon, and the IMA supplies the distal two-thirds of the colon. Where they have some collateral flow or where they have shared flow, no one blood supply is dominant. And therefore, there's actually vulnerability for ischemia in that area. And typically, the splenic flexure, worth noting in your mind, the splenic flexure is, the, is that classic watershed area where we typically see ischemia. So if a CT scan or a colonoscopy shows inflammatory changes there, shows signs of ischemia there, that's consistent with a low flow watershed state problem, and that's a typical cause, typically the thing we see in, in ischemic colitis. Again, typically with, again, ischemic colitis, we, we try our best to treat them medically. It's not always possible, but what we do when we're trying to treat these things medically, we, we make them MPO. The idea being that if they're fed, that's going to increase the metabolic demands of the colon. It's going to have to work harder. We support them with fluids because dehydration is frequently a cause and hypotension is frequently a cause of their trouble. And then we use maybe use antibiotics. And the reason why we would do that is because in the area of ischemia, there might be 
um, risk of translocation for the bacteria systemically, even though it's not an infection problem, we're protecting the patient as a whole from the ischemic insult of that area. And by uh, giving them antibiotics, that helps. Surgery does happen um, when the patient uh, has a peritonitis and um, is limited typically to just that segment um, that uh, gives them uh, ischemia. There's no rear vascularization procedure for the colon, so there's no bypass procedure. We're resecting the area of dead colon. And because we're resecting colon and the setting of poor blood flow, we tend to not make anastomosis. We tend to, to create um, a uh, colostomy. That's a typical move for that. A little bit of uh, focusing on imaging diagnosis again. And we're really, at this point, talking about um, both small bowel and large bowel. I'm just bringing some general concepts in. So a CT scan is about 75% sensitive and nearly 100% specific when we're dealing with arterial occlusive disease. So it can miss some small vessel stuff and the patient still has intestinal ischemia. So it's negative predictive value is not perfect. Um, but when you see the area of infarct, when you see the clot, that's 100% specific. We're very confident, oh yes, there is a, an occlusive intestinal ischemia when it's present. So, so present is much easier, much more reliable than, um, than absence, I would say. When we're talking about uh, those watershed areas and colonic uh, intestinal ischemia, ischemic colitis, it's a little less sensitive. One point I want to mention is that is this idea of uh, oral versus IV contrast. Just to, just to introduce you to these concepts, if you're doing a CT scan with IV contrast uh, for an ischemia, you do want to withhold the oral contrast because if the lumen is bright, you're not going to see a difference between the lumen and the blood vessels. I'm actually going to jump back here to the slide. You can see here that there's no contrast in the lumen here of these, uh, of these uh, loops of small bowel. You see these, these are small bowel loops, but there's no, they're, they're not filling with any, anything inside. And that allows you to see nice, clear outlines of the vasculature against the small bowel. It helps you determine whether there's ischemia and what the degree of clot burden is. If you had, if those loops had been completely filled with um, contrast, then you wouldn't see the difference between the vessel and the lumen, and that would actually uh, obscure your view. Again, um, as a general concept, and this applies to small and large, is the idea of damage control procedures. So what we're doing with damage control procedures, we're trying to save the organism additional insults. So we're cutting out the dead bowel, the, the bad segment, but what we're not doing is we're not putting it back together. We are um, leaving them in what we say discontinuity. We have an open abdomen and we're coming back to the operating room within 24 to 48 hours. And that allows us to then make an asthmosis or bring out a colostomy or stoma and close the abdomen. Rarely when we're operating, we're going to perform an embolectomy. That may happen in small bowel arterial occlusive disease. And I have seen it rarely for venous, but um, it's, it's really not uh, the approach. You're using embolectomies as the approach for to remove an embolus in an acute occlusive disease of the small bowel. But if we do an embolectomy, again, we're talking about high mortal procedure. So this is my last slide, and I just want to summarize a couple little things just to give us a closure here on the ischemic small bowel versus large bowel. Again, we're going to bring in the concepts of some of the categories here, and that'll help you. So if we're talking about arterial occlusive disease as a cause, that's a, a disease typically of the small bowel, not so commonly the large bowel. Again, if we're talking about venous occlusive disease, occlusive disease, acute occlusive disease, um, again, it's rarely happens in the small bowel and almost never happens in the large bowel. Large bowel tolerates venous occlusion really well. If we're talking about a low flow state, that's really a disease of the large bowel. Again, those watershed areas, the small bowel can happen, but it's rare. If we're talking about surgery, we frequently do surgery to manage uh, small bowel obstruction. We rarely do surgery for ischemic colitis. It's more of a medical uh, support approach, except in those situations where there's dense ischemia perforation, et cetera, which do happen. So recognize much more common for small bowel ischemia than large bowel. So, and it helps you, they're different diseases. If you hear intestinal ischemia, well, you know, if it's large or small, it's gonna have a huge impact on what kind of management is being done. 
Again, we rarely succeed to manage it when we're talking about small bowel ischemia, medically management, I should say, and with large bowel ischemia, we commonly successfully manage it. When it comes to revascularization procedures, they are uncommonly done for small bowel, but they're never performed for large bowel. Mortality rate is much worse for small bowel than large bowel. Large bowel is much more common, much more successfully supported medically, much less uh, mortality. Again, the classic feature that is not the only thing, but the classic feature, the way to describe it, pain of proportion is the classic feature for small bowel, and it's those bloody bowel movements are the classic feature for the large bowel. Again, colonoscopy is used to diagnose uh, large bowel ischemia with some CT, and the CT angio is what's used for uh, the small bowel. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you uh, from my home to yours. Feel free to email me, contact um, the uh, unit or the, the module uh, director. I'm more than happy to, to help out and answer any specific questions, any confusions, anything you, you um, didn't understand or, or uh, didn't line up with what you've uh, been taught in the past. I'm happy to clarify uh, those issues. Anyway, thank you very much.